So my name is Cadell Walker. I am the Director of Advancement for Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest. Uh, we are now embarking on our end of the year campaign, which it's hard to believe that we're already at the end of the year, uh, but we are quickly approaching it. So uh, we have two campaigns a year, and this is again our end of the year campaign, and it's titled For the Planet, For You. Uh, Bernheim does so much, so, so much. And um, as being a member and supporter of Bernheim, I'm sure you're aware of that. But unless you actually get time with Bernheim staff, it's very hard to see and to really get a grasp of all that Bernheim does. So this For the Planet For You campaign has given us a platform to be able to launch a series, um, For the Planet For You series, where folks can actually interact with the staff through Zooms, learn more about more in depth about the programs that they're doing and uh, get to ask questions of the staff. Um, you know, we've got horticulture, we've got nature-based education, conservation, art, nature, research, community outreach and play and so much more. So I would like to introduce our newest director of horticulture. Uh, her name is Renee Frith. And so she's gonna talk a little bit from the horticulture perspective at Bernheim. And then we'll be around to answer any questions at the end. So I'll kick it over to you, Renee. Thanks, Cadell, for uh, sharing a bit about the campaign. And I also want to give a big thanks to Amy Landon for being my technical support from behind the scenes. So thank you for that. And uh, today, I want to talk about diversifying your plant portfolio. So um, but before we do, I, just a little background about me. As Cadell mentioned, I'm new to Bernheim. I've been here right at two months. So, but I've been in horticulture my whole career. I'm, I'm originally from Alabama. I got a horticulture degree from Auburn University and then I set my sights out in the world. And so all those green trees represent um, places that I've worked. I spent a lot of time down in Florida working in the commercial industry of horticulture before going to Virginia and uh, working as a, a curator of woody plants at Norfolk Botanical Garden. That's on the coastal side of Virginia. And after that, I uh, went on to be director of greening programs at a small nonprofit, Delaware Center for Horticulture. And that organization um, really spends time getting green infrastructure into the urban environment. But now I'm here and I really feel like I've hit the tree lottery uh, being here at Bernheim. Um, so just some of my hobbies, I've been, I've been hiking and kayaking pretty much my whole life. So I've here's here's I've kind of hiked around the United States. Um, all the little red hikers are um, are, are forest uh, hikes, and the two purple hikers. I, I love urban hiking. So hiking in cities and understanding how those tree species adapt to that urban environment. And so I want to kind of encompass that into uh, into this topic today. So just to get us in the mood, uh, let's start with a quote by Marcel Proust. And the quote uh, reads, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in, having, but in having new views. So each experience with the natural environment can spark our inquisitive nature and lead to further understanding in preserving it. Today, my goal is to share diversity of thought when we assess and we select our plants for the urban landscape. And don't worry, we're gonna look at some pretty plants too. So as a budding horticulturalist, these three words, conservation, regeneration, and restoration were just not in my daily lexicon. When I started out, I was uh, working for organizations where land acquisition for the purpose of development and landscape design and installation were at the forefront of my vocabulary. Um, so it was basically a philosophy of let's uh, tear it down and build it back up. But I have a high inquisitive nature about my environment and a true love of all things trees. And so these words uh, have risen to the forefront of now my lexicon and play an important role in how I manage landscapes. So where are we? We're at Bernheim. Well, I'm at Bernheim. I wish you guys were too, but we'll, we'll imagine it virtually. So just, this slide just gives you an idea of the outline or scope of Bernheim. And so this uh, satellite image gives you a better visual of the canopy. 
And conservation is a conscious practice of identifying and protecting resources. Bernheim is a great example of conservation in motion. Bernheim Forest is one of the best remaining regional stands of oak hickory and oak pine forest. And Bernheim's Arboretum, which I'm so honored to help manage, is a repository for some rare US native species and many fine examples of native trees that I just feel aren't used near enough in the urban landscape. Through our management of living collections, educational messaging, and engaging with visitors, we have the opportunity to help conserve green infrastructure in that urban environment. Over 90 years ago, Burnham looked probably much like the surrounding land that we see in this image. It was deforested, mostly pasture land, devoid of a lot of the canopy that we see in this image. But Bernheim is in its 91st year of regeneration or regrowth. And regenerations happen through these years from both natural and artificial means. And restoration, which is simply the act of returning to, uh, is happening continually here at Bernheim through ongoing invasive removal strategies. The introduction of fire has been another great tool to keep species at bay. And it's shown especially, especially promising results uh, regarding oak regrowth in the forest. So I quickly touched on uh, and I mentioned rare uh, US natives. And I just wanted to have an aside and share with you uh, the story of this Betula uber, the round leaf birch. This is an extremely rare US native that is found only in one county, Smythe County in Virginia. And when I first started at Norfolk Botanical, I saw that they had this tree in their records. And so I got really excited because I understand how rare this is. And I skipped out there like a little schoolgirl, and I went to see this tree and it was a group of eight of them. And I thought, all right, well, I just read this record and there's not a lot of detail there. It's not, you know, where it came from or whatever. It just, it, it was there in the record. So I, I said, are we sure this is Betula Uber? Because this tree, the round leaf birch is also can be very similar to the sweet birch, which is, Betula lenta, and there's very um, a very fine line between those two. So we, uh, the propagation manager and I, we keyed it out, and the variation difference between these two species really comes down to if you'll look in that picture to your right, you'll see the veins in those leaves. And so if there's anywhere from two to six pairs of those veins, it's Betula uber. If there's 12 to 18 pairs of those veins, it's Betula lenta. And so we ended up having Betula lenta at Norfolk Botanical and my heart was broken. I thought I'd never see this again until I happened to be walking through sun and shade here at Bernheim. And lo and behold, here it is. I finally got to hug this tree and it just made my day. So now let's get back to the satellite images that we were looking at. And while Bernheim may be the largest privately held forest in this region, uh, it really pales in comparison to the urban growth that we're noticing in cities around us and Louisville. And Louisville's a, a good example for our acre comparison. We're 16,140 acres. Louisville's 254,515 acres. So, um, you know, it's well known that Louisville is a heat island. We, we are all very aware of that. And we're very aware that there is a lack of canopy coverage um, in Louisville and, and cities alike. Louisville is no exception to other urban environments. But we know that urban, uh, rapid urban growth is an accelerator of habitat and species loss. And so how did we get to this? How did we, we lose all this? Well, I blame it on elementary uh, art lessons. You know, we learned uh, straight lines, don't color outside the line, everything has to be symmetrical. Um, and so that's, that's where I'm going, that, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but with all seriousness, there are many urban challenges. 
Humans need necessities like food, water, and shelter for survival, and there should be no shame that we want to survive. Uh, and I have to believe that none of the problems that we're facing, whether that's invasive species, pollution, erosion, all of these urban challenges, I don't think they started maliciously. No one set out to say, hey, we're going to like totally degradate species. Uh, but uh, economy and not really sustaining the natural environment is usually the driving factor for how we got here. You know, that linear design approach for how we move water, we usually like want to capture it from A and then take it down in a in a cement tube to B, and we want to do that in a straight line. And no soil is ever in that mix. So water has nowhere to infiltrate, uh, nor does any of that soil have, have the ability to benefit from that water that's being moved. So there's a lot of times little or no thought or understanding for the environmental web that's being torn down. So now that we know more about the environment as we evolve as a species, we have an obligation to do more for the environment. And the EPA has done studies, um, and one study that they've done uh, centers around what are some challenges to getting green infrastructure? You know, how, how do we increase canopy and in these urban environments? And so these groups all are usually at the table, municipalities, developers, engineers. And so a lot of their challenges are, are valid and simple. It all centers around there's current laws and ordinances in place, and we would need to change those if we're going to have a, a real driver of green infrastructure. There, there could possibly be higher cost. We don't know how this is going to perform long, time, long term. And always, I hear this always from expect not only municipalities I'm not trying to just pick on them but from everyone is maintenance cost you know what is it going to cost to maintain these environments long term well the good thing is um it's doable it's happening and um out of this slide here I just wanted to pose a question what are some groups that aren't routinely at this table it's groups like this and how do we bridge these two? How do we, how do we uh, garner support from environmental groups and agencies and meld those with all of the developers and municipalities that are building these cities? You know, it's happening. Uh, there's movement in this area, but um, voices like ours um, have to almost interject themselves at the table sometimes. So what's our biggest challenge in all of this? It's time. You know, a lot of, a lot of people say, hey, we're already behind the eight ball on a lot of environmental movements, and we are. Um, but it takes time. Uh, we need to adapt to, you know, the changes. Everyone needs to be able to get on board, and, and these things just take time. But plants took time and they were able to have, uh, they were able to adapt to their environment. So in the center picture right here, uh, you have bald cypress. So bald cypress, I, I just love this tree. Um, so it's, uh, it has a couple of ways that it's adapting to its environment. So there's pore spaces um, in that cambium layer. The, the term for the pore space is arenchyma. Sounds kind of fancy, but what that does is it allows oxygen to be diffused um, from plant parts above the water. So whether that's the trunk or the leaves above the water. And then it has shallow roots, believe it or not. And so that helps with gas exchange at the soil surface. But as you can imagine, this is a really tall street, uh, tree. So if it, if it has shallow roots, how does it stabilize itself? Well, as you can see, it has that buttressing, or uh, the fancy word is hypertrophy. So those, the buttressing or um, flare at the base of that trunk helps it stabilize itself. On the left-hand side, we've got Crataegus or the hawthorn. This is another um, really spectacular tree. It has um, really bright red berries, and the birds just 
are like magnets to these berries. So that's an adaptive quality for that species to reproduce. But it also has thorns. And uh, if, if you'll notice, hang on, let me turn on my mouse and I'll hover over. There's a thorn right here and there's a thorn right there, but these thorns, uh, thorns are just modified branches, believe it or not. And so the whole idea is it repels herbivores. So the tree doesn't want to get eaten because it needs to photosynthesize so that it can produce those berries so that the birds can eat them and carry them away and go make more hawthorns. And on the right, uh, this is magnolia, another one of my absolute favorite tree species. So magnolia came on the scene prior to bees. And so we think of pollination a lot of times as you know, bee or butterfly pollination. But this tree is actually pollinated by beetles. And so um, let me turn my mouse on again because inside here, there we go. Right here is the carpal or the female part of the flower and the stamens or the male part are on the outside. And so beetles just love pollen. So they're attracted to the pollen. So they go up to this flower and the male uh, flower parts produce first, the stamen produce first, and the beetles are just loving in this pollen. And they then the female or the carpal starts to form and it almost mimics a stamen. So the beetles go up to it and say, hey, I think we're gonna get more pollen. And then uh, the flower gets pollinated and, uh, and the beetle um, has done its job. And the, and the plant also now, that carpal will turn into a seed pod. So uh, reproduction happens from that. This, um, we have, this is a picture of a magnolia that we have in our collection uh, here at Bernheim. This is Magnolia Legend. It's a, a cucumber magnolia, um, but it's known for that light yellow color. It looks creamy in this picture, but it, it really is a light yellow. Um, yellow magnolias have uh, been big in breeding preferences um, over the past couple of decades, and they're getting better and better. So plant groups in ecosystems also have adaptations. And temperate deciduous forest, which we, we are a temperate deciduous forest in our area. These trees normally have thicker bark because they can withstand freezing temperatures. Uh, deciduous tree canopy drops its leaves. So then in the springtime, before spring flush, the sunlight's able to get down into the canopy and that opens up the opportunity for spring ephemerals to grow in that forest. Uh, the broad leaves of these species help with photosynthesis and um, phototropic uh, behaviors so that they can reach for light. And then on the right, we have, you know, the almost the polar opposite of a temperate forest, which is an arid forest or an arid desert. And so these uh, plants adapt through either really uh, like a taproot. So this saguaro cactus has a taproot um, or some of the shrubby uh, plants and perennials have a massing root system because what happens in the desert is their rain doesn't come consistent like temperate forest. It comes in spurts. And so and when it comes down, it comes down in a rush. And so a mass of roots has a better ability to grab onto some of that water as it, as it tries to filter through. Night blooming of a lot of plants also helps, um, helps with po uh, pollination, but also helps with uh, not having water loss, just as waxy leaves. Um, and then one thing that I just think is really cool about um, succulent plants and cacti is they can reproduce through vegetative reproduction. So a piece of them can fall off, hit the ground and reroot. And this helps so they don't have to produce seed because producing seed takes up a lot more energy. So just understanding how all these plants um, try, to, try to live is just absolutely really fascinating. Um, and so the picture on the left was taken at Norfolk Botanical Garden. So this isn't a 
what I would call a true forest. This is a, a garden setting, but I, nonetheless, I thought a really good example. Um, and on the right um, is uh, at Sweetwater Preserve, which is northeast of uh, Tucson, um, Arizona. And this is on the Black Rock Loop Trail, one of the many trails I've hiked out there. So why are we, you know, why are we talking all this adaptation? Um, and it's a couple of reasons. A, it's just really cool to think about. And B, uh, we can learn a lot from plants in this regard about how we adapt to our environments. And C, adaptation has everything to do with species survival. So when you're thinking about plants, think about them in ways of how do they survive and how can I best help them survive? But know this, every species has its breaking point. That is, environmental changes are happening more rapidly than the plant's ability to adapt. And we are seeing extinction of species due to accelerated climate change. So in an urban environment, how are trees adapting? How are plants adapting to urban environments? And I read an article some time back and I wanted to just uh, refresh myself. So I read the article again um, a couple of weeks ago and it's from the Yale Environment 360. Um, it's entitled Urban Darwinism, How Species Are Evolving to Survive in Cities. And it simply, uh, in a nutshell, says that we need to keep in mind how all species are evolving, not just plants, but how are mammals, how are birds, how are insects evolving in these man-made urban environments. So there's a lot of things happening. There's changes to feeding preferences. There's changes in genetics. The ways that these species are breeding are changing. And it's not just birds and, and uh, mammals that we're worried about. So the tone of this article is that green species, both native and non-native, uh, have already established a dominant presence in the urban environment. And you know, through natural selection, we've, we've created in urban environments some apex predator, uh, if you will, if you coined that term, apex predator plants. Um, so they've, those are the, the bulletproof plants of the urban environment. But my thought is, you know, don't just only rely on the bulletproof species in these urban environments. Let's keep adding natives back in. Uh, add, add, add all the natives. Um, because after all, not all non-native plants are, are beneficial. And what we're looking at and this is another picture out of Tucson, but it's a great example to this point. This tree right here is what, what I wanna focus on. So this is downtown Tucson. There's uh, the river that runs right, oh, oh, my bad, let's go back. There's a river that runs right through here. And if you go further to the right, you'll hear it hit Interstate 10. So this tree right here is the Red River Gum, um, Eucalyptus camelodensis, Red River Gum. And this particular tree is over 100 years old. It's 95 feet tall and it's six feet in diameter. And that seems really impressive, like, right? It's super impressive. So here it is from a street view on the left-hand side. And uh, so this species is native to Australia. It has little to no habitat value. So its pollen is pretty much worthless. Uh, has no berries to, to feed anyone. Um, it's a bit of a water hog too. Uh, eucalyptus can be that way. And so it's been declared invasive already in Hawaii and California, but not yet in Arizona. Um, but even through all of its misgivings, I still hugged it anyway, because it's a tree and it was the biggest one in Tucson. But to my point, um, you know, not all non-native species are beneficial for the environment, even though they can take up a lot of real estate. And one other species that I think some of us will be familiar with on this call is uh, the crepe myrtle. Um, so, and, and I hope, you know, no one gets upset with what I'm about to say about the crepe myrtle, but it, you know, it's not native. It is rather pretty. It does have a long bloom time, but those are all aesthetics or, or you know, pleasing um, attributes to us as people. 
uh, the nectar value is a little to no benefit to honeybees or native bees for that matter. Um, so every time you plant species that don't have a, a good host or nectar or um, adult food source benefit, you're taking up real estate from a species that could. So how do we start to kind of uh, start ensuring diversity in our, in our own areas? So we start to understand our site topography or how our our land slopes, where are the peaks, where are the valleys? How does water flow through our property? What's the soil made of? Is it, what's the pH? And what type? Is it clay, sandy loam, a combination? And keep in mind that just because you test in one area of your yard or property, it could be different in another area. Um, and then if you can understand the history of the site, and this can be, um, this can be a bit tough at times trying to find out, you know, how your land has been used in the past. Um, know the surrounding topography, you know, what are your neighbor's yards like? Where does your neighbor's water flow? Um, especially if it's flowing toward your yard. <laughs> and then on, on your site, uh, scout for the existing plants and animals. And I love to do this. If I have a new site, that I'm trying to work on. I really like to scout in spring and summer. And that gives me a, a general good understanding of the pollinator, uh, the pollinators that I'm gonna, gonna see on that site. So now we're, we're gaining more diversity. And so types of plant diversity, there's four main types. So phylogenetic, that's that evolutionary or high level diversity of species but taxonomic. And so like I use tax, the word taxa and species interchangeably when I'm talking about plants. And so, um, so if I say that throughout this program, I'm talking about individual species of trees. So um, at that species level, so it could be, you know, willow oak um, or white oak. Those are two different species. So taxonomic are species uh, differences. So some structural diversity. Uh, this is just as you would think, structure, how it's built. So what, is, what are some of its uses? Is it, is it canopy tree? Is it shrubby understory? Is it that mid-level understory tree range? Or is it a ground cover? Like how, how is it serving in that landscape? And then lastly, functional. And this is, this is more of what does it do for the ecosystem that it's in? And so I definitely think that you'll get structural and functional if you focus on species. So always make sure that your species diversity is great. So you definitely, just because you've got, you know, you really, really like sugar maple, do you really want all sugar maple on your property? You kind of want to switch it up. So use the site conditions to your advantage when you're starting to think about how you're gonna create a list. And minimal soil disturbance is key. You don't wanna come in you know, with a bulldozer and like clear everything off and then start over. So creating that species or taxa list, a species list um, with a habitat focus is really how I like to go about um, creating a planting plan for a landscape. And, you know, what does that all mean? And so here's how my brain works when I work, how I think about creating lists. So first, you know, species information is, uh, or just any plant information in general is just, you can go on Google and there's so much information. So where do you really wanna get that from? Uh, personally, I like to go to universities other arboreta, botanical gardens, and I like my own personal field knowledge because, um, you know, for species that I've been growing my career, I've got that baseline knowledge uh, in my head. And then the other thing I like to focus on is what are the, what, what are the, these plants going to do? You know, how are they going to be important? And I put a lot of value into wildlife and host 
uh, I put equal parts into soil, moisture, and their growing conditions. So, you know, what moisture do they need? What moisture do they like? What, what's the soil tolerances? Can it be dry, wet? What's the pH? And then the growing conditions. Where do they normally like to live? Are they an upland species? Are they a lowland species? Um, what, what all can they adapt to? And then the la last thing I put is my personal aesthetics or interest in that plant. Because usually if I'm getting some good host value out of it, there's, all, there's already going to be a benefit in it for me. So here, I love list. okay? Everybody that is going to get to know me at Bernheim is going to know I just love list. And so when I, uh, when I got here, I kind of was like, all right, what are some native trees to conduct? Kentucky and how can I like put those together so I put a list together and this is based on birds and I just said hey you know these species are good for birds and then you'll see some colors out here I also like to color code based on bees so if the bees are native or if they're honeybee or if they're both you know so what are, what's the value of those species and uh, I mean you can make your list any way you want I'm just giving you a, a an example of how it happens in my head. And so let's talk about some really great trees. So on the left, we have Prunus serotina or the black cherry. Uh, the fruit is highly desired by birds and mammals alike. It's a larval host to numerous, numerous species of butterflies and moths. And it's a really versatile tree. You can use this just about anywhere, wet conditions, dry conditions, all different light conditions, um, but I love it. And so that was what, what was good for everyone else. But personally, I just love the structure of this tree. Look at that, it looks so gnarly and that fall color looks really great. Uh, this is just a beautiful tree. And if you haven't seen this tree up close, there is really nice bark interest as well. Uh, the tree in the middle, is um, another favorite, it's uh, Amelanchia or service berry. And there's many species that, uh, of service berry. So I'll just talk about first in broad strokes. Um, the birds absolutely have a feeding frenzy when the uh, fruit is set on this tree. Uh, they go crazy for it. And uh, this is a picture of um, the downy service berry, Amelanchier arborea. Uh, but uh, there's a really great cultivar in the in the trade. You guys may be familiar with it. It's um, Autumn Brilliance. It's Amelanchier X grandiflora, Autumn Brilliance. And so that's a cross between two natives. It's a cross between the downy service berry and the Allegheny service berry. Um, so that's that's really nice when you can get a a, a cultivar um, that's from the parentage of two native species. And I will say, if y'all haven't had a service berry pie, if you can beat the birds to this and make a service berry pie, it is to die for. Um, the tree on the right is my absolute favorite tree, um, probably of all time. It's it's been on my favorite trees list now for five plus years, and and it's it hadn't fallen off. So this is Nissa sylvatica, the black tupelo. It's a great nectar source for honeybees. Um, the, this tree is dioecious, so there are male and female trees. So if, if you have a female tree, it'll produce the fruit. And the fruit is very attractive to birds and mammals. And look at that stunning fall color. Uh, there's, there's a great cultivar that I would recommend, uh, Afterburner. Uh, this cultivar stays you know, a little on the small side, um, 30 feet or so at maturity. Um, so that's a decent size for urban settings. Um, but this fall color holds on so long. So right now, a lot of leaves have already dropped and I can still see this shining red example of uh, Nissa sylvatica uh, at our education center here at Bernheim. So I, I made lists for mammals as well. And as you'll, you, you may notice, some of these trees overlap. So they're good for both uh, birds and mammals. 
Um, and that's okay. I mean, trees are trees can do it all, really. So now let's just look at some more trees. Uh, this picture on the top left is of a semina triloba. Uh, that's the pawpaw. And I hope you guys really like this tree as much as I do. I know the zebra swallowtail and pawpaw sphinx love it. It's a larval host for them. Uh, the fruit is edible to, and mammals love it. Some people love it too. Um, I've had some uh, a pawpaw beer actually uh, in my lifetime and it was quite tasty. The yellow fall color is just really remarkable. It has this really massing or clumping form. Um, the picture at the lower left is of Cornus Florida, uh, the flowering dogwood. It supports, it's a great support for native bees. Uh, fruits, uh, <laughs> again, birds and mammals love it. Larval host for uh, the spring azure butterfly. Uh, it's a great understory specimen tree. Uh, it just has gorgeous spring bloom and striking red fall color. And this tree is very sentimental to me. Um, this was the first tree I ever planted in my lifetime. Not this particular one, but a dogwood. Um, my mom and I planted this, uh, a dogwood in our front yard. And we were in, my mom lived in that house for over 20 years. And every time I came back, even after I moved out, that tree was still there. And so I just, I have a real affinity uh, for Cornish, Florida. Um, and I'm, I apologize for the picture in the middle. It's a little grainy, uh, but just hope, hopefully you trust me that that's a gorgeous tree right there. <laughs> that's uh, Ocellus pavia, pavia, the red buckeye, and uh, it's a really great benefit to native bees as a nectar source, honeybees too, and a nectar source to hummingbirds. So um, as you can see on the right hand side, a big, uh, it's a blown up picture of the bloom and it has those tubular flowers on a panicle stalk. So, um, I mean, you can just imagine those hummingbirds just coming in for a nectar landing. Squirrels enjoy the fruit. They have uh, not huge buckeyes like the Ohio buckeye, they're a little, little smaller. But squirrels have fun with those and the red bloom is really stunning to look at. And uh, one thing about these is it will drop leaves early, but don't worry, uh, buckeyes are okay. They, they're they one of the first to drop their leaves, um, but their uh, their buds are so huge, it looks like little candles. So those are, those are always fun to look at. Um, so I made a host list and this is really, I'm, I, I really wish I would have gotten into entomology uh, sooner. Like I have a really, I have a love of photography and insect photography has kind of uh, come up to the top of my list on, on uh, things I like to do as a hobby. So I, I like to make host lists. So if I can see these species, I'm gonna capture them on uh, through a photograph. And uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dr. Doug Tallamy of the University of Delaware, but he really sums up host species best. Uh, he, one of his books, Bringing Nature Home, um, he puts it really simply, 96% of all terrestrial birds feed on caterpillars and sawflies. And it's a major source, a uh, food source for them when they're nesting. Uh, some birds, we would normally consider as uh, feeders of other sources like hummingbirds and seed eaters, they actually need those insects to feed their young. So no other uh, insect group supplies as much valuable food sources as the Lepidoptera, which are moths and butterflies. So that's why I love to have a host group is because I want to be able to make sure that there's food for those little bird babies. So looking at some more trees on the left-hand side, that's Betula lenta. I, I touched on this tree earlier um, when I was talking about the round leaf birch, but this is the sweet birch. And it's a, it's a adult food source for the green comma butterfly, larval host for the morning cloak and dreamy dusky wing. 
and uh, mammals love to browse this tree. So they'll take off a little bit of foliage um, here and there. And the birds love the seeds. And if you crush the, the twigs, it smells like wintergreen. And this tree can uh, be in commercial production for wintergreen oil. The middle is Lyria dendron tulipifera or the tulip poplar. Again, what a great tree. Um, many opportunities for nesting birds. You can see uh, how a lot of those branch attachments just look like a perfect habitat to build a bird's nest. It benefits the honeybee. It's a larval host for the tulip silk moth, the eastern tiger swallowtail. It's beautiful tulip shaped blooms. It's, uh, and it has this leaf. If, you, if you're familiar with this leaf, I, it looks like the Cheshire cat. Uh, it, it looks like a cat's head. Uh, great yellow fall color. And the tree on the right is Diosporus virginiana, the persimmon. So fruit set just got finished with this guy this year, but birds and mammals love that fruit. And uh, coyotes especially love this fruit. And then you can see it deposited everywhere. <laughs> uh, humans also like this uh, fruit and uh, it's a good browse source for mammals when the branches are low. So on a younger tree, it'll be browsed. And larval host for the luna moth, which is an absolutely beautiful moth. It benefits the honeybee. It has a really great columnar shape. So while this tree gets tall, you know, 60-ish plus feet, it's, it, is, it stays really columnar. So I just really think this is a great um, tree for urban environments. And it's, it's just bulletproof. Um, it'll grow in all sorts of conditions. And, oh, and an aesthetic benefit to humans, it has some amazing fall color. It looks like it's on fire. So if you see this and everything around it hasn't turned yet, it really looks like there's a fire in the woods. And how can I forget about the oak? I saved the best for last and I did this on purpose. So we, these are all native oaks and I just pulled out the leaves. And so on the left-hand side, we'll go top to bottom. So we've got the willow oak, the white oak, the shingle oak, the scarlet oak, and the pin oak. And on the right side, we've got the northern red oak, the chinkapin oak, the Quercus, I mean, I'm sorry, the chestnut oak, the bur oak, and the black oak. And so these were always some of my favorite um, trees growing up in Alabama. They all um, grow very well down there and I've been very familiar with them. So it's happy to see that these are also native here. And in the center is a picture of Quercus Fellows. And this is, um, if you could say an oak flowered. This is kind of what it would look like. This is uh, when it's putting on its catkins um, in the spring right before the leaf flush. And so this is a true, the oak is a true legacy species. This is one of those trees that you can plant and it will last generations. Um, it's long lived and it has tremendous host benefits. And I just want to, I, I mean, Dr. Doug Tallamy, um, again, really says it best. Uh, oaks support 534 species of Lepidoptera, and those are the butterflies and moths. Remember, those are, that's what feeds birds and baby birds. Um, so more than any other native tree or plant, the oak does it better than any. These are caterpillars that are not only a primary food source for migrating and breeding birds, but they're essential for the babies. So um, if you don't have an oak in your yard and you do have space, uh, please consider planting an oak. We have a great oak collection here at Bernheim and uh, hopefully um, we can do some uh, in-person tours soon. So another way we can look at things is what if we have a lawn? And so I kind of did a mock-up of a lawn and I'm like, okay, well, this is kind of everybody's backyard lawn that I grew up uh, visiting. So I just want to do a quick soapbox talk on lawns. So just let me, let me have a moment. Lawns are chemical sinks. They're water hogs. They take a lot of time. They have minimal interest or, or uh, benefit to the environment. 
and I don't like them. Okay, so I'm over that now, and I'm sorry if you have a lovely lawn. I'm I'm sure it's beautiful, but I just think there's a better way to do this. And so how do we change the narrative of what a lawn is now? We just plant a pollinator in it. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm kidding. So uh, th we, this is at Norfolk Botanical and we, we planted a, a pollinator maze. So we can actually turn our lawn spaces over um, into, into a small scale conservation effort. So this is a, you know, many people's urban space lawns, like front yard, backyard. And so you still have that mowed turf edge around it, which is perfectly okay. But, you know, there's many things in here. There's, um, there's some sporabolus, there's some big top love grass. I see some tropical milkweed. I see some phlox and some fennel. And there's all sorts of other stuff just uh, smattered all around in here. And this is a great sink for pollinators. Instead of a sink for water and chemicals and effort, it's a great sink for pollinators. And this is a space for them to overwinter if we let that grass um, stay and not mow it until spring. Oh, and by the way, this was at uh, Chanticleer. I just wanted to give them credit for this. This, this was at Chanticleer Garden up in Wayne, uh, Pennsylvania. So now let's look at that same thing, but on a much bigger scale. And I just am really excited about the big prairie uh, here at Bernheim. Um, and, you know, how many, I'll ask you this, how many moths, butterflies, bees, flies, all, all the pollinators, how many of those do you see hovering around your maintained turf? But this is what we see on the daily basis in the big prairie when it's in bloom. Look at all these pollinators that are coming. And there's many more. I mean, this is just a really small snippet. And there's everything out in that big prairie. There's a, a big blue stem grass all the way to wild quinine, uh, Asclepias tuberosa, the, the milkweed. There's common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca. There's thistle. Monarda is a great one, really, really great pollinator. Uh, there is solidago, the aster. Um, so many. And, uh, and if you want to kind of, um, this is not my chart, by the way, I give all the credit to uh, the uh, Chattanooga Area Pollinator Partnership. Um, but you can find a lot of different uh, charts out there for, for pollinator interest. And um, with perennials, I just, for whatever reason, I just always keep those in my head. So I'll be glad to talk about any of those um, offline. Uh, I'll share my information at the end, but you can always look up um, different perennials and there's so many out there that are native uh, to this area. Don't forget that deciduous trees are one of the best sources of mulch. And there is, um, you know, some people feel certain ways about this, but I truly feel like uh, deciduous trees give me the best mulch because once they fall, uh, they help overwinter uh, the pollinators. And so I don't want to rake up those leaves and put down new mulch because I'm disturbing the pollinators while they're trying to take a nap. And lastly, uh, I want to try to keep everyone focused on connectedness. So we've talked about different aspects. We've talked about trees, um, which uh, most of the time people think trees, they think forest. We've talked about perennials, which a lot of times people think, oh, okay, a, a prairie. And, and these things, they think about them as separate and they don't have to be. So um, whether it's wetlands, grasslands, meadows, upland areas, prairies, um, there are species and mammals and insects that rely on more than one habitat for survival and reproduction. So make it easy for them. If you can create edge environments, which is, this is a good example of an edge type environment. It goes from the, from the water to a little bit of a, a perennial planting to a more forested area. So it's not 
disjointed. They have uh, an area to kind of transition from one space to another. And it's that connectedness that is, uh, is really gonna help um, continue um, all of our conservation efforts. And so I, I'm all ears now for questions. And uh, I put my contact info. You're more than welcome to email me anytime you'd like, whether it's about this presentation or about anything else. My email is renee.frith at bernheim.org. And um, just before we do that, I just wanted to uh, say that we, I just wanted to thank you for participating today and for the Planet for You. And we appreciate your continued support an interest always in what we're doing here at Bernheim. If you want to learn more about For the Planet for You or see other opportunities to um, or register for other topics, you can go to bernheim.org forward slash for the planet. And up next in this series, and I'm so excited, I can't wait to hear him talk, is Andrew Berry, Director of Conservation. And he's going to give a presentation on the birds of Bernheim, the Golden Eagles. And you can catch that next Thursday, November 19th at 10 a.m. So it'll be from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And at this time, I just open up the floor for questions. You all can either put them in chat or, um, or unmute yourselves if you just wanna ask a question out loud as well. Yes, Maggie. I think you're still muted. There, there we go. There we go. Hello, hey, Maggie. Thank you for all this wonderful stuff. I had a just a, a question about the photo at. Um, I wrote it down. I can find it. Oh, that Chanticleer Garden photo. Which yes. Had, which had the edges of the the lawn still there, but had all that beautiful stuff in that. Um, how old was that planting? Was that a previous year or was it something that's even like five or 10 years ago? Because for so, me, the trick is maintaining. Right, Main, maintaining <laughs> is is always <laughs> always a struggle. So uh, Chanticleer has, um, has an unlimited budget, I'll say that. Okay. Um, so they do change out periodically the interest and it's strictly for interest in there. So they'll change out some species just so that the visitors aren't seeing the same thing every year. Um, but a lot of the um, the main players in there, so those grasses and like the, uh, there there is some, um, some penstemon in there. Um, and so they keep a lot, probably I'd say probably about 10 or 15 core species. And then they change out maybe five or 10 species a year. So that planting at that, I was there two years ago when I took that picture. And I know that they have had that for at least five years prior to that. So that's, that landscapes, that space has probably been happening for about eight or nine years now. Okay, but I don't see anything in there that's like microstegium or, or cemetery grass or anything yeah. that come and take over my my space. Right. That's my fault. I invited one of them in because it smelled like my grandmother's house. It sat in the place that I put it by the hollyhocks for 35 years and never moved. And now if you want to look for the Bullock County epicenter of cemetery grass, it's right here. Oh no. Yeah, a lot of um a lot of challenges go into getting um perennial started and as a lawn alternative. Yeah. But one good thing that I like to do is if you have, if you're put in a sunny location, which I hope you are, um, I try to solarize that space first, meaning that I'll go get two sheets of plastic and it's that thick poly from like Lowe's or Home Depot and I'll double it up and I will put, put stakes down in it. And uh, so through the months of our hottest months, which would be July, August, I'll just leave that plastic on and the temperature will get so hot in there that it'll cook a lot of those, the undesirable seeds in that soil. And then you can go in and, and plant. You'll have a lot, lot more success 
And then I also like to initially add a thick layer of mulch to my perennial plantings, just to help further suppress any, any seeds from germinating. Any particular mulch? I mean, wood chips good enough? Or I like wood chips. I love wood chips. And a lot of times you call up a tree company, they'll dump some for free in your yard. Okay, I'm comparing that to some of the things that I've planted before and thinking how many of them I've let them just grow back and we're mowing again. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I'll try again, some more, I'm, or expand, I've still got some, yeah. And if you're having a tough time too, um, a lot of uh, native grasses will help overtake some of those spaces. Um, or if you have a shadier situation, you can put in some ferns and they like to really take up some space and they'll choke <laughs> out. What kind of ferns do you plant? I mean, if you have a if you have a shadier space, if you're trying to do a lawn alternative, kind of in a shadier environment, you can do lady fern or um, cinnamon fern. I don't believe is native, but you you can. There's a lot of different ferns out there that'll work. I like using the lady fern because it clumps extremely well. Okay. Well, I am on a I'm on the edge of Bernheim, so I'm basically in the same woods, except we put in a house in the middle of it. Ah, so um, um, okay. I never thought of put promoting the ferns. I mean, they grow naturally, and they're around the edges. Yeah, and I, I you know, I'm gonna try a little um, experiment for myself and see if it works. I have a patch of microstegium um, under some bald cypress, and I'm. This spring, we're going to buy in a bunch of lady ferns, and I'm going to see if the allelopathic nature of those ferns will choke out that microstegium. All right, put me on this. I want to. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna give it a go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Clumps. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. I had to write that down. Yes. No problem. Renee, Mark has a question for you in, in the chat. Uh-huh. What's you to reiterate why lawns can make such a big difference for conservation? Oh, okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, so lawns, and I, I'll go over this again. I, I can't say this enough. So lawns in the sense that we know them, um, the monocultured mode lawn is a, is a sink. It's a sink for water, a sink for chemicals, uh, a sink for time to maintain it. And if we can turn that over to an alternative, like a pollinator space, uh, for example, our big prairie, um, then we're having a sink for pollinators and not a sink for chemicals. Well, we are just about at noon. So, or sorry, one o'clock. Um, so um, last chance for questions and otherwise um, we will thank everybody for coming and hope to see people at, an, at our next session. I have one more quick, quick one, if you want. Um, you showed us lists of um, your different lists of trees or different types of things. And I missed the first one. Oh, right. wow. this. So if you wanted to post that again before you disappear, I'll take a picture of it and then. Yeah, absolutely. Here, let me see if I can uh, just back up here. This is very low tech. <laughs> oh yeah, no problem. Hey, it works. Uh oh, I went too far. There we go. Yes. All about the birds. There four birds. Ma'am. I thought there was one before birds. Let me just take. No, ma'am. It was. I did. I just did birds, mammals, and hosts. That's it. Okay, it was right. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. No problem. What fun! I appreciate you doing this and in this format. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, Renee. I think it was a great presentation. I learned a lot. <laughs> and just a reminder, go to bernheim.org slash for the planet for more information and uh, more information about the calendar of events as well. Thank you all for your support. We appreciate it.